I'd like to spend just two minutes because I want to give acknowledgement to what was here happening last night. Um, I know David is going to be talking about the reformers. You know the reformers, each and every one of them had a decision to make. They came from the church at that time and they realized, you know, what we teach and what is in this book are not in harmony. And so they had a choice, they had a decision to make. And so I'm very, very proud, and I can't mention everyone. And I realized that not everyone could make it because of work situations, obligations, and I understand that. But I want to tell you that I am so proud, and it's too bad these two little boys are not here. I want to start off with Rudy and Alex. You know, Alex, if he was here, I would say the same thing, but he could be a little travieso, let me tell you. His dad always tells me, get on him, stay on him. But let me tell you, when we went out and hit the streets, him and Rudy, I had to hold them back. And they would go, now, 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 Frank, now, Frank. <laughs> and I would literally go like pit bulls. And they would run after the people. And they'd say, hello, tenemos cosas de Dios. Yeah, we have things of God. English is bad. And they did not get rejected one time. They were so full of enthusiasm. And I could see the excitement in their eyes. And I was so proud. I kept telling them, I was going to write. I was so proud of those my dad. Because they were doing the Lord's work. And I invite all of you who couldn't make it, if you can't make it, and even if you could make it, you could pray for us. And then there's Diana and Michelle. I can hear Michelle's voice from afar uh, approaching homes. See, it's not palabra de Dios. And she would say it so cute, with so much conviction. And then there was her sidekick right there. And I could see, I could see Diana standing there like, hey, you better not mess with her. You know? And then we had Ernie with Susan. We had a representative from the conference join us as well. And then we had the guys, you know, Ernie and Christopher. And then we bumped into Christian and he joined us as well. And so I just want to share with you, let me tell you, that last night, I'm sure everyone can share an experience they had. And we ran into a few young people. Let me tell you, I ran into one family where they're all sisters. And one of the sisters, she's a devout Christian, and the others weren't, they're teenagers. And she said, Frank, please, um, can, you, can you talk to my sisters? Well, obviously we can't uh, preach a sermon there, but basically, we just had a little nice conversation. And I looked at the eyes of one of the girls, and I had to tell her like this. Mija, I can see the Spirit of the Lord is on you. And I touched her, because I had to. I could see the Holy Spirit working just in her eyes as tears began to come from her. Not because of me, but it's the Holy Spirit working and she's nodding her head. And her older sister is like in tears as well. That's the blessing that we receive when we go and do that. So I want to encourage all of you next year to join us. And don't even wait a year whenever we go out and do a cool thing. It, we, it's just so awesome. So awesome. So on behalf of the church, we want to thank all of you. All of you. For being there and making that decision to do the Lord's. Anyways, so if I can have uh, two volunteers to collect the tithes and offerings. They come forward. And I'm so happy to see Pastor Molina with us today. We're blessed to have you. We're very happy to have you. It's our guest. Heavenly God, Father, we just want to praise your name. Thank you so much. Because when your son was here, when he said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. I thank you because you just fill us with so much life. And now, Father, it's time for us to 
give to you what belongs to you and give offerings to you, Father, that belong to you. May this money that we collect right now go to uh, for your purpose, wherever it's being used, so that we can complete your work here on earth, so that you're coming to be soon, and Father. These things we ask in your Son's name, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
today. Your mom just passed away. So we, Wendy and me, we got together and we said, can we pray for you? And they said, yes. So they, they were smoking. They're like, oh, we'll, we'll throw this. You know, it's, it's disrespectful. We'll throw it. They didn't, we didn't say anything. I was like, if, if you want to do it, it's up to you. We don't, we don't mind. So we threw the cigarettes on the ground. They stepped on it and they got close and we started praying. Mm. That was yeah. a coincidence. Praise God. That was it, it is an amazing thing when you go out there and you do this because you see God work. You literally see God work. Again, these things don't just happen at a random. It, it, it's, it's really good. You guys can be that. Alright. Now, to the sermon. Uh, how many of you like history? Love it. Amen. Daniel Carlos is telling me I love history. So, um, I call it the past or loss of the future. So, can we say that the Israelites going forward to uh, Jesus' time? Was there a history before them? Yes? Yeah, was there people before the people in Jesus' name? Yeah, so they had history, right? They had a reference. They had something to be guided through. So uh, some stuff that happened in the past made them what they were that day, correct? So they, they, they had a reference. They had something that they could follow. So I'm going to ask you guys, what is history? Who can give me your definition of history? What do you guys consider history as? Major past events, all right. Anything else? A story of what? Stories of past life. Okay, yes. Personas, characters, people that live back then. Anybody else? It predicts the future? Or can it change the future? Do you think that history can change the future? Something that happened back then changed how we are now? Because if it didn't happen, we wouldn't be dressing maybe suits like that. And suits would be dressed as something else. Did you consider that? All right. So this is what I got from history. History. What is it? A branch of knowledge dealing with the past events. So it's a knowledge. It's information that has to go to the past and, and, and events that we have knowledge of, right? A continuous systematic narrative or past event as relating to a particular people, which is what he said. Con country, period, person, etc. You should be reading as a chronological account. So it's uh, events or knowledge of people, countries, uh, etc. that happened back there and we have knowledge of. And acts, ideas, or events that will or can shape the course of the future. Immediately but significantly happen happening. So I'm going to give you some examples of some stuff in history that changed how we live now. So here's some example. The medical revolution. The discovery of medicine is an antibiotic still remains as one of the greatest of the medical discoveries. Discoveries. It has cut down the human mortality rate by a large figure. Not just health, but the discovery, discovery led to a series of other discoveries which have impacted human life. Then we have the discovery of vaccination. Then we know with vaccination they cured a lot of diseases that if they were still here, if it wasn't for vaccination, we would probably still be at a very low population. Because there, there were very, very bad diseases that would kill people by millions. So, did this affect the way we live now? Some of us might not even be here if it wasn't for vaccinations or penicillin. Back then, if you get like a little cut without antibiotics, you could die. So, did that affect the future? Yes. Yeah? Alright, cool. So, you guys want more? Let me give you another one. You guys ever heard of the industrial uh, revolution? Yeah. yeah. What's the industrial revolution? Uh, basically, they make machines. <laughs> yeah, and that opened doors to more things. And it opened doors to more things. And it, opened doors to more things. it wasn't just about the printing press. We, we got railroads, we got tracks, we started getting the telephone, we started getting the radio, and then one led to another, and then it kept opening doors and doors and doors. We have this technology because of that. Because of that era. If it wasn't for this era of, of opening your want your mind just like with local information, we wouldn't have computers, we wouldn't have monitors, we wouldn't have camera. That so the, you think that affected the way we are now? Yeah? Big time or small time? Big time. Huge? Alright, so can we use that same concept with religion? Yes or no? Doubt? Yeah? Can we use history to portray what we how what we believe now? Yeah? Alright. So, a lot of people I know are familiar with this era. What do you guys know about the Dark Ages? 
Very bad in what sense? Disease. There was a lot of war? Okay. Diseases in the dark ages? Yeah, there were. Persecution? Yeah. Now we're going into religion? Uh huh. What else? The Bible? What about the Bible? The Bible was scarce or was locked up? Okay. This is cool because I found this article and it's perfect for what we're going to talk about. And this is what it says. The Dark Ages is an historical period used originally in the Middle Ages, which emphasizes the cultural and economic deterioration that occurred in the Western Europe following the decline of the Roman Empire. The label employs traditional light versus darkness. What does that sound like? Who's the light? And who's the darkness? So I thought this was really interesting because it came out here. In imagery to contrast the darkness of the period with early and later periods of light. So it's a period of darkness. So let's put it like this. So you have all this period is darkness. And through those periods you have little spots where boom, a light came out. And then over here, boom, another light came out. And over here, boom, another light came out. And because those lights were happening, some the future was being changed. Okay? You guys follow me? Alright, so we got that part. Now, you guys are familiar with the Reformation, right? What can you guys tell me about the Reformation? Yeah, that's good. Anybody else want to answer that? Because that's pretty good. What do you guys think? What was the Reformation about? She knows. She knows? What is it then? It's always a church. For some strange reason, the church is the one that puts us in the dark. 
So then you go to the, to the dark teachers and you have the church, the one that's supposed to be the light, and again puts everything to the side and they say, no, you have to do it our way. Exactly the same thing. So then, let's go, it's going to get really interesting. What was the first thing that was corrupted? So we're talking about corruption. We're talking about darkness. Everything was put to the side, right? So the first thing that was corrupted was the sacrifice for our sins. The sacrifice for Christ was replaced by what? You guys know what indulgence is about. Right. If you're going, yeah, you can pay ahead. Yeah, yeah, you can pay ahead. So the way the way it works, it wasn't specifically to to forgive your sins, but it was so you could avoid the punishment of the sin. It's just a twisting of words. It's kind of the same thing. So you could sin, but you won't be punished. You won't be burned. So that was the whole idea of that. So then you have one of these corruptions that came into this dark ages. What was next? Baptism. What was happening with baptism in that dark ages? Baptism was replaced with child sprinkle or child baptism. So it wasn't no longer about you going and submerging yourself. They would grab like Jarrell and they would sprinkle him and say, okay, good, you're saved. You need nothing else? Go on, you're going straight to heaven from here. Yes? And it's important to know that during this baptism, Constantine would say, hey, we can make it easy. At time of baptism, we can register these new babies as Roman citizens so that they can collect their taxes. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Got it? That's cool. This year's cool. We're not going to go too deep because we're going to get too long, but that, yeah, that's true. All right. Let's go to the next corruption that was happening. And you're going to, you're going to, you're going to see some really interesting stuff. The Word of God. The Word of God was replaced with the traditions of man and the laws of man. Did that happen? Did that happen before Moses? Did that happen after Moses? Did that happen in the Dark Ages? It's the same thing over and over. It keeps repeating itself. We keep falling in the same thing. So God's word, the Bible, was saying, you know what? We don't need this right now. We're going to we're gonna put um, indulgences. We're going to baptize children. We're going to have to worry about it later. You know, and, and, and it keeps going. It keeps going. So everything was in the dark. Nobody knew. And of course, since the Bible wasn't there, the people couldn't say, that's not right. Because there was nothing at all. So they just had to go for what they said. They couldn't read it, which is the same thing. Well, some people won't work that way if you have Bible. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, you're in the right track. All right, next corruption. Prayer. How was prayer replaced? With saints? Yeah. So prayer was replaced by a confession booth. You no longer ask God for forgiveness, but man. This is funny, we're going to go back to the booth because this is really, you guys can see. Remember that we're going back. And remember, always remember that Moses. Because we're going to go back again to Moses. It's going to be pretty interesting. So, no longer prayer was needed. They say, you don't need to pray to God. I'm righteous. Love. Come and tell me your sins and I'll take care of it. So you had all this priest and man that were taking the place of God. And again, God was put to the side. So then, next corruption. The light. What was the light represent in the Bible? It represents a few things, but I want you guys to, to, to tell me. Witnessing? Okay, yeah. Anything else? Jesus. Who? Jesus? Yes. Anything else? God's people. God's people? Yeah. Witnessing? Yeah. Anything else? One more. The Bible. Okay, so you have those three things. You have witnessing, us, people. You have the Bible and you have Christ. Those are three lights that, that's in there, right? So then that was replaced by, again, uh, uh, laws and, and, and you know things of, of men. People were not allowed to speak. Everyone was kept in the dark as to what God, uh, God's character plans and laws were. So nobody knew that we had to step up. Nobody knew that we had to evangelize. So everybody was quiet. If you said something against the church, you were automatically you know excommunicated or put to death or taken out of the, uh, the synagogues. Exactly what they were doing in Jesus' time. If you don't agree with what we're saying, you can't come into the church. Exactly the same thing. Creepy, no? Alright, next one. The law of God. What happened to the law of God? It was replaced by what? Which one specifically? No, no. Which law? Sabbath. Yeah, by men, but what law? The Sabbath. The Sabbath? So then the Sabbath gets switched. And then uh, the, the, the other commandment, they, they, they take one away, and you know, the one about... Uh, not have any other gods before me. And then the, the, the last one where he says don't covet, they split it into two. So 
So they completely remade all of God's stuff. Everything was in the dark, and of course, people couldn't know. They didn't know. They didn't have any reference. They didn't have anything to go back to. Jesus, of course, wasn't there. The disciples were all gone. The only thing that they had was the church. So they were just following, well, if the church says it, I'm going to follow it. They didn't have nothing to go to. All right, so. Oh, stop. All right, you're on. You're not on? Yeah. There you go. Okay, so what does the Reformist history have to do with all this? That's one of the questions that I keep in your mind. And how did it change our lives now? So we're going to see that now. How, what was the point of the Reformers? How, how, what did they do? And how did it affect the way we believe and how we worship now? And it's going to get really interesting. So let's go deep into history. Let's go to the Reformation. Anybody know who John Wigley was? This all started in the 1300s. And you're going to see, remember the beginning history? It goes chronologically. This is going to be fun. So anybody know what uh, John Wigley? Any history? Michael, you know John Wigley. Christopher, you know John Wigley, right? Anybody tell me anything about John Wigley without reading that? <laughs> you already read it? He translated. He translated what? Yeah. Okay, so he started in, uh, well, he was born in 13, uh, 1313 and he died in 1384. Uh, he started the movement of Lord Arts. You know who, who the Lord Arts were? They were the first uh, reformers. They were, uh, they were, they were called Lord Arts. Lord Arts is uh, like a demeaning thing. They were considered kind of dumb because they weren't too educated. They only knew like one language, but they were uh, all Bible straight. They were Bible straight. And they were against the Catholic Church and the stuff they were teaching. So John Wycliffe was an English scholar, uh, philosopher, theologian, lay preacher, translator, and university teacher of, uh, at Oxford in England. Known as the Morning Star of the Reformation, this is a guy that started everything. And I'll show you why he started everything. So what did he do? Does anybody know what he did? What is that? All the things that were wrong the church. No. Translated the English Yes, to the common language. So that's what he did. Wigley completed the translation of the Bible in the year 1382. So now, what happened to people? Remember the people didn't have any reference to go? How could I know if he's telling me the truth if I can't check it? So then he prints this, and boom, the Bible is there. So what happens? The people can see it. The people can see it, yeah. So there's your life right there. So then, this happened in the 1300s. What happened in the 1400s? Martin Luther. Now you go. No, Michelle. Oh, oh, these are the world. Mm -hmm. The thesis? The thesis? Did you know that the anniversary was yesterday? The anniversary for that was yesterday. So what do you know? Yeah. 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 Because without this, we wouldn't be here now. So, this is what happened with Luther. He was a German friar, Catholic priest, professor, theologian. And I'm going to point something out. All these, the majority of these guys were Catholic. The majority of these guys were Catholic. Okay? So, what did he do? He disputed the claim that freedom from sin could be purchased with monetary values, indulgences. That's what got him. He had a bunch of other things, but this one was the one that really bugged him. And that's the one that opened the door for him to say, you know what, I gotta say something. So then, God sacrificed for us. The church was saying, you know what, if you give me so much money, I'll stamp this paper, and you're free to go. And if you give me more money, you can sin three months ahead. You can sin three months ahead. So you pay now, and you can think, oh, you know what, I, I already been saved. So I'm gonna go get drunk for the next three months and I'm gonna be cool. That's how it worked. So that was a big confusion. So that really boiled his blood. So he was out there and he started saying, you can't do that. All right, next time. 1500s, the order that is going, chronological order. One light opened another light. And that's how it was working. Anybody know who John Calvin is? John Calvin, no? John Calvin was uh, born in 1509 and died in 1564. He was a uh, Presbyterian. Do you know what a... I can never pronounce that word. 
Presbyterian. Presbyterian. Presbyterian, yeah. You know what that means? What do they believe? Pre. No, pre. Yeah? Say that. Predestination. They believe in the, in the in predestination. But they also did something else. Okay, so this guy was a French theologian and a pastor who wrote from the Roman church. This is all from the Roman church, okay? And what did he do? He brought prayer back to the people. Calvin calls prayer the chief exercise of faith by which we daily receive God's benefit. So this guy comes over and he starts going through what they already, what other before, reformers were going through, and now he finds prayer back. You no longer have to go to a priest. Jesus is there. We can go straight to the man. Why do we need another guy so we can uh, ask for forgiveness? Why do we need another guy so we could uh, ask him for stuff? When we have the God of God, the King of Kings, and we could just go straight to him to pray. So he brought that prayer. All right, next one. John Smitty. Anybody know John Smitty? And this is uh, 1500 to 1600. What does the word baptist mean? So this guy brought baptism again. So you see how it all starts chronologically work? You, you'll see in, in a little bit. Ordained as an Anglican priest in England. Soon after his ordination, he broke uh, with the Church of England. What did he do? And this is what he did. Smitty came to believe in believers' baptism as opposed to infant baptism. They came to realize that you have to be conscious of getting baptized. You have to be aware that you're a sinner and you're consciously accepting to choose God and put that part of your life aside. Does that make sense? It wasn't just about sprinkling somebody and you're saved for life. You have to come to God and say, I accept you, I know I'm a sinner and I will get baptized because I have conscious of what I've done wrong. Make sense? All right. So, we have John Wesley. Everybody know who John Wesley goes, right? Yes? No? Alright, John Wesley, 1703 to 1791. Methodist. We have Methodists here, right? Not here, but you know, there's still, all these religions are still out here, right? An Anglican divine theologian and ordained priest. What did he do? Does everybody know what he did? Any idea? No? What's up with the best? He was what? Yes. This guy knows. Wesley's ministry was to travel and preach outdoors. The light comes back. Remember when we talked about the light? We have the Bible, we have Jesus, and who else is supposed to be the light? Who is supposed to be the light? This guy was the one that said, you know what? Well, you're not supposed to stay here in church. We're supposed to go out there. When we're doing out uh, yesterday, passing on tracks. We're supposed to be the light of the world. In the darkness, we're the ones that are supposed to go out there and tell the people that there is a God, that there is a Bible, and show it to them. Alright, so, what does that have to do with us? Somebody tell me. Anybody? How does this change what we believe? Or... Yeah? All those denominations or priests in one. Uh -huh. So we, we have everything, we have a full, full of complete puzzle. Can you prove that? Of course. Yes? Alright. So let's, I'll ask you that question again. History. That was history. So now, how does this historic event of people affect us now? They were called, what? Protestants. Protestants? Right. What does that mean? Wait, wait, wait. No, my, my. Against what? Someone against uh, teaching or something like that. Against the. Uh huh, uh huh. It's, it's in the right way. So then, uh, oh, uh huh. So maybe like not a person, but maybe a group of people against a certain uh, way of knowledge or thing, well, thinking. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yes. You were talking about Protestants and they were going against the Roman Catholic Church. Yes. That's the exact definition is that one. Protestantism is the form of Christian faith and practice that originated with the Protestant Reformation. The Reformation was a movement against the Protestants, against what Protestants considered to be the errors of the Catholic Church. So you, you got it on the dot. So that you have this dark ages, you have this power that's controlling everything. You're in the dark because you don't have the knowledge. You have to follow what they say because you have no reference where to go. So that the Protestants find the Bible. 
And then they, that Bible opens up and they start seeing these things. And they're like, and they're thinking to themselves, wait a minute, where is child baptism here? I don't see it. You know what? You guys are doing this wrong. So then they start coming out. They find another tooth, they come out. They find another tooth, they come out. So, they, but it all started with that one reference. Now, remember that we were mentioning Moses. What was the big, the two major events that happened with Moses? Come out. Mm, bigger than that. The Ten Commandments, and what's the other one? It's a map. It's a map that we were supposed to follow. The what? The sanctuary. Okay, you want me to prove the sanctuary to you? Alright, you guys ready for this? This is cool. Let's start fixing the errors. What is that? The showbread. The aerospace. John Wigley, the Lord's. The Bible. He translated the Bible. There goes the showbread. You can eat now. John 6, 35. And Jesus said unto them, I am the bread of life. He that cometh to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth in me shall never thirst. So who's the bread of life? Jesus. And what's another term that we use for Jesus? And the, and the word of God is God. And God knows the word. So then you have God's word. So then that gets opened up. You have a light. Next error. What is that? The altar of sacrifice. Martin Luther, 1400s, saved by grace. Romans 9, I mean Romans 10, 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. So it wasn't no longer about indulgences. You didn't have to buy it. All you had to do was go to, you go to Christ. So that break comes back again. Next error. What is that? John Calvin, 1500s. Ephesians 5 2. And walk in love as Christ has loved us and hath given himself for us as an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet smelling savior. So then you have Christ in prayer. You don't have to go to man, you go straight to the Creator. And then you have the essence. Prayer. So Calvin brings back prayer. And all these things start piling up and piling up. Then you'll see where the map leads. What is that? What does that represent? John Spady, the Baptist movement. They bring back thinking back. John 3 5. Jesus has for very, very I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So then you guys are starting to see the picture, right? What's starting to get back together? The sanctuary started to get back together. So the same thing that the Jews had, that roadmap that told them everything that they needed to know was put in the dark. And then little by little, every hundred years, boom, a light would spark. In this dark period, boom, boom, boom. And then they all start uniting and uniting. What's next? What is that? John Wesley, the light. What did he say it was? A minister. He was ministering outside. Matthew 5, 16. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So whose light? Our light. So we're supposed to be the light out there. Alright? So then what does this create? What, oh wait, one more. What is this? Alright? So then we go to the 1800s. And what happens in the 1800s? What does that do for us? Yes. What is that? That's where we came from. And we start putting all those things together. So just for the record, when you see those people out there that live in the religions, religions, no, be hard for them, because if it wasn't for them, it would be. Okay? We just gotta kind of put them all together. Alright? So then John 14, 15. If you love me, keep my wife. So we're the last key of the puzzle. We figure out that baptism is still there, the sacrifice of Christ, we have the light, we have the bread, we have the, the prayer, and then we figure out the Ten Commandments were changed. And 
we come back to the Ten Commandments and we start worshiping on the Sabbath. So then, what does that build? Alright, so this is our message. We believe that we're saved through Christ's sacrifice. And because we believe in Him, we baptize ourselves, we kill the old man, and we become something new. And through the study of the Word and prayer, we become the light so that we can take people to the Ten Commandments and to the mercy seat. Isn't that kind of cool? And it's all there. You guys want to hear it again? Alright. So we believe that we're saved by Christ alone, by His sacrifice. Because we believe we get baptized and we kill the old man and we become something new. We feed off the bread of God and we pray so that we can become the light of the world and show the Ten Commandments and take it to the mercy seat. <laughs> 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 Alright, so let me go back again. What is a Protestant? You're welcome? Alright. Protestant. No, you already know the answer. Don't tell me. But I have any kind of answer. Anybody? What's a Protestant? Uh, the what? Protestant. Okay. Do you know what an acronym is? Come on, Eugenia, tell me. What's an acronym? An acronym. It's uh, I don't remember exactly a word, but you can mix it up to a different word. This guy's gonna preach this out of it. <laughs> yes, that's it. It's a word made up of two different words, so it'll make it easier for you to say. You know, it, 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 it takes less time to say. So you have a Protestant. You wanna see what Protestant means? You ready for this? Pro in favor of in support of, in conviction to something. You want to know what the other word is? Testament. Proof of them or evidence that something exists or is true. A covenant between God and the human race. Either of two main divisions of the... So what's for Protestant? We're pro the Bible. We're pro the sacrifice of Christ. We're pro prayer. We're pro baptism. What else? You guys following? We're pro what? We're pro pro the law. Yeah. We're pro ministry outside. So how does that affect us? Are we supposed to be Christians? So what are you guys protesting? Are you guys protesting? Or are we fighting the protesters? Are we? Ooh, nice. Perfect. Or are we fighting the protesters? Or are we just staying in the dark? Where? No, I don't want to do <laughs> I don't want to do anything. I'm too scared. Thank you, brother. Uh, because it helps us all put the whole puzzle together. Mm -hmm. So this message, we should uh, get this on the internet and study it message on how we, we can look back and we're blessed as Adventists because knowing the truth is not enough. We have to act on it. We're in that final piece and that's where we get our name Advent. We're proclaiming the second coming of Christ and help our fellow Christians put everything together. Nice. So, I'll ask you guys again. Are you protesting? Protesting. Yes or no? Yes. What are you doing here? What is your purpose? Why do you come to church? Perfect. Are we doing that? Are we protesting? Are we being the light? Are we teaching God's law? Are we being... Are we baptizing people? Yes. Yes? Yes. Or are we just kind of... Well, I'm glad somebody said yeah. Thank you. Amen. <laughs> Alright, so go back again. Now you guys tell me. What do we believe? And because we believe? And then we feed ourselves with what? And we get counsel from who? 
and we become the what? The light. So that we can show him what? And take him to the who? To the mercy seat. So there's your advocacy. There's your history class. Are you guys going to protest? Or are you just going to sit here and stay in the dark? Protest. You have all this. We have, we have this message. But 90% of the people that are here don't even know anything. So how are we supposed to take the people out of the darkness out there and free in the darkness in here? Are we spending time to study this? Are we coming in here really wanting to know about God and reading the Bible? Or are we just here because our friends come here, our parents bring us here, wasting our time, and when we go out there, we are exactly like each other. There's no difference. We don't protest about anything. Homosexuality? None of my business. Abortion? Is there a baby? The Sunday law? Well, I'm going to Saturday, so that's your problem. You guys get it? So what are we doing here? Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, since the beginning of time, you have told us what we should do. You have given the Israelites in Moses' time this great map, this, uh, this GPS, if you want to call it, of how we're supposed to act, what we're supposed to do, and how we're supposed to do it out there. It was corrupted in that time. It came to the Dark Ages. It was corrupted again. And now it's in our time. It's the same message. Nothing has changed. We're the ones that keep implementing things or changing or saying it's not like this or it's not like that. But it's right here. All we have to do is read it. So then we ask you, now that we have this information, now that we can look it up ourselves, now that the Bible is here where we can actually go and reference, where we can say why Saturday and why not Sunday, we could look it up. We're not doing it. The Protestants gave their lives. They gave their husbands, they gave their wives, they gave their job, their money, their kids, so that they could proclaim this truth. And we have all this truth. We have the greater light. We are out there. And we could do so many wonderful things in the world. And we choose to stay in the darkness. Not because they're forcing us. Not because they're taking the Bible away. But we just choose not to do it. So we ask you right now. Let the Holy Spirit work in us. Now that we have seen this truth. The Bible is an amazing book. When we really read it, we'll find so many wonderful things in there. If we could dwell in it and put the things to uh, the world to the side and we could really concentrate on this, we would be such a light out there that nobody could even... Just like Moses came up from the mountain and people were afraid of him, we could have that ability if we could just go down into our knees and beg you for it. So we ask you that you protect us and you guide us that this information stays in our minds and in our hearts, that we could keep studying, we could keep it closer to you, ask for forgiveness, and if need to, re-baptize ourselves and say, I want to be that light. I want to feed off the Word of God. I want to pray to Him. I want to tell people about a sacrifice. And I want to bring them to show them His law, so to show them He's just, so that they can come to the mercy seat and ask for forgiveness and they can live forever. Amen. Stay with us, guide us, and thank you for this blessed Sabbath. In your glorious and merciful name, amen. Amen. amen.